Who were the different tribes at the time of Jesus in the Bible? That's what we're going to talk about today. Religion says, earn your life. Secular society says, create your life. Jesus says, my life for your life. Timothy Keller. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about the people, groups in the Bible in the time of the New Testament. We're going to back up a little bit and talk about some of the tribes because who the tribes are affects who the people are in the New Testament. Believe it or not, Judaism has this huge train of history where people kept track of what tribes they were from, what people groups, the land that was owned, all the way back from the time that Israel was established as land for the people of Israel. So backing it all the way up to the land, Joshua takes over for Moses. And at that time, the 12 tribes were given land. They are all the sons and grandsons of Jacob. This is about 930 BC. So we have the tribes of Asher, Dan, Ephraim, God, Issachar, Manasseh, Naphtali, Reuben, Simeon, and Zebulon, and they formed into two nations, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Joseph wasn't given land, but his two sons were given land, and that was Manasseh, the big land, and Ephraim. Ten of the tribes made up Israel, while Benjamin and Judah made up the land of Judah. They split up, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about Old Testament stories, too. The 10 northern tribes were in trouble geologically because they continually were sacked, attacked. They were taken off by the Assyrians. When the Assyrians removed the people groups, they replaced them with Babylonians, with Persians, with Canaanites, with Moabites, all the different people that were living in this area. So when the Assyrians sacked a place, they just mixed up who lived there. It broke. I think, the national ties that you had. And when you have a tribe of people who will not marry other people, it's hard to break down those barriers of ethnicity. And if you want to get into some interesting conspiracy theories, there's all sorts of stories about what happened to the lost tribes of Israel. Most likely, they assimilated into other nations. They became maybe even isolated people groups inside of those nations. They lost their identity. And the other likely idea is that many of them, whoever's left that identifies as part of the tribes of Israel, still lived in that land. Not everyone could be taken. A good chunk of people were taken, but not everybody. With the conspiracy theories of where did the tribes of Israel go, if you even look at Wikipedia, it has some likely theories. The tribe of Rumid, conquered by the Assyrians, there's a image of them being hauled away. And Ephraim has ties to the Sumerians. And there are Persian Jews who claim to be part of Ephraim's tribe. People feel that parts of Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulon were found in the land of Judah. And so they ended up going there. Many of them stayed in Babylon as well. People feel the tribe of Zebulon became the Druze people who have a separate faith, similar but separate, considered to be pagan faith from the Jewish people. People feel that parts of Dan, God, Asher, Naphtali hauled off to Assyria and became Assyrian Jews. And the tribe of Simeon was deported to what was called the land of Aksum, which is in Ethiopia. There are other groups of people as well who were considered to be part of that exile to Ethiopia. The group in Ethiopia that believes they're part of the house of Dan, they're called Beta Israel, who some say were descendants of Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. They have traditions that connect all the way back to Jerusalem. 1973, the chief rabbi said that these were Jews and they were brought to Israel. The Igbo Jewish group was thought to be from Nigeria and descendants of Ephraim, Naphtali, Manasseh, Levi, Zebulun, and God. But there's not a lot of evidence to support that. There were claims made by people in Japan. The Lemba people were in South Africa. And there were many other claims, too. Like I said, you want to get deep into this. There's all sorts of theories about what happened to the lost tribes of Israel. And again, some people made their way into Judah, faded into the tribes of Judah, or stayed in the land, hidden away from the Assyrians, trying to avoid being captured and just ended up staying there, probably becoming part of what was considered to be the Samaritan tribe. There were Assyrian Jews 
Josephus, the great Jewish historian, was a Syrian, converted to Judaism, so you know it was there in that area. And there were also other Assyrians who converted to Judaism. There were Jewish people in Kashmir, which would have been part of the Persian history. There was a group called B'nai Manasseh, who were accepted by the chief rabbi in Israel in 2005, saying that they have a claim to be part of the lost tribes of Israel from India. There was a group called B'nai Ephraim, I'm assuming B'nai means son of, called Telugu Jews, who said they descended from Ephraim. They say they traveled from Israel to Asia, Persia, Afghanistan, Tibet, and into China. 1,600 years before arriving in southern India more than a 1,000 years ago. But because they only have limited Jewish heritage and they were practicing Christians after Baptist missionaries arrived there, they were not accepted as part of the tribes of Israel. And in more modern times, the Mormons thought American Indians were one of the lost tribes of Israel. When I was in Israel during my archaeological dig, we had workers on our dig site who were Ethiopian Jews hoping to gain citizenship, not just refugee status inside the land. It was really interesting to talk to them because they had really detailed stories about their history, how it went all the way back to the Old Testament until today. But like I said, this area was always under attack and under threat. And that wasn't the only sack. There was also the Babylonians who also took areas and took people groups. And it was hard for the North, obviously, when you're being attacked all the time being overcome by people, nations that were around, it's hard to maintain your identity. And then the southern area of Judah, which was made up of Benjamin and Judah tribes, they had a little bit more natural protection just because they were farther away. But then when they got exiled to Babylon, they were returned. And so they retained their people group. You know, they were able to then see themselves as an identity together as compared to the northern tribes that just had trouble time and time again. People also had the vibe that if there was going to be the Messiah that was going to come and rescue them, it was going to come from one of these lost tribes coming back to their nation and taking it over and restoring the nation of Israel and Judah entirely. It's even more fascinating now that we have DNA and we can see certain people groups. I was just reading a paper about the different people groups inside of Israel. They have still today a very tight DNA group. In fact, they were saying that people who were Ashkenazi Jews, which is what I grew up as, are all related to each other within six degrees. The genetic cohesion of the people group is different than every other people group in the area and also same among themselves. They also see that when they find other Jewish groups in other nations. The genetic ties are deep and they aren't closely related to the Canaanites, the Moabites, the Phoenicians, and other Arabic people groups. They are their own unique group. So from the map point of view, Judah, again, is going to be in the south, and it's going to include places like Hebron. Simeon was also in their land towards the very south, and it was near what was called the Wilderness of Zin. It was very far south, close to Edom, which was where the Edomites lived. Benjamin was a very tiny nation that was towards the north and included Jerusalem. That made up the southern tribes. Then when it came to the northern tribes, you had Dan, which was on the coast. It was a beautiful area. It had Joppa. And Joppa is where they think that the story of Perseus, where he's rescuing the woman who is chained to the rock, took place there. It is a little farther north than where I was, which was in Ashkelon, which was part of the Philistine land. If you think of David and Goliath, if you think of Samson and Delilah, my area was Ashkelon. North of that was Ashdod, and north of that was the area of Dan. Just a little bit north of that is Ephraim. And then comes the big land mass of Manasseh. Manasseh was the very largest part of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it had smaller areas for Zebulon, Issachar, Asher, and Naphtali. And those were more towards what would be in Syria today and where Jesus went to in Tyre and Sidon. Gad, G-A-D, and Reuben, and they were on the east side of the Jordan River, as was part of Manasseh as well, and that would be where Jordan is today. And after these nations got sacked time and time again, again, some of this area later became Phoenician, became Greek, 
They started building the Decapolis, which was Greek cities in this area. That is further south than Galilee, which we talk about in the Bible in small steps where we're doing Matthew. But Samaria was a group that was just north of Jerusalem, but just south of Megiddo, very close to Megiddo. And people avoided it because these are now become two people group that really don't like each other very much, even though they have amazingly close ties. The land of Samaria includes where altars were built by Moses. And so that's where they considered that to be the holy mountain, while the tribes of Judah considered Jerusalem to be where the temple should be at, because that is where Solomon built the temple. So they even have wars between the people groups about where God's holy spot was. So let's talk a little bit about the Sumerians. This is what is made up of the remaining lost tribes of Israel or the northern tribes of Israel. And they call themselves the children of Israel. They believe themselves to be Israelites in Samaria. And there was even a city of Samaria, which is how the region itself got its name. The town itself is called Shemar or Shamir, and it was built in the 12th century BC. And because it was sacked, the people groups were replaced. They also got exposed to gods of other nations. And so they had a series of very bad kings. And it all comes with King Ahab slaughtered religious, dedicated Jewish people. He also practiced in child sacrifice. This is where we get the story of Jezebel, who also brought in paganism and brought it into the land of northern Israel, Samaria as well. And the area of Samaria was ended when it was attacked and taken over by Greeks. Herod the Great retook the area and gave it an honor to Augustus. The name itself means the watchmen. I'm sure they felt like the watchmen on the gate because they were the ones that had to guard against all these nations attacking them all the time. Today, they still consider themselves to be the people of Israel, the children of Israel. They don't see themselves as anything but. Josephus talked about the people of Samaria interchangeably with other people that lived up in that area. And you'll even hear about it referenced in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They talked about the Samaritans there as well. So some of that separation happened in the time of Ezra when they started really looking at each other as different people groups instead of just one nation of God's covenant. They also believe to have had the Ark of the Covenant or a duplicate of the Ark of the Covenant. It's where the Ten Commandments were left in the hands of the Jewish people. They carried it around inside of the Ark. You can see Indiana Jones talks about the Ark of the Covenant. They're mentioned in the Talmud and in Josephus. And they believe that they are true Hebrews. They don't see themselves as a different group. In 2 Kings, Judah already started describing them as foreigners because, again, they were mixed up by these nations that took them over. So the level of distrust grew greatly by them. And they also fell deeply into traps of paganism. This is where Elijah would fight the Baal worshipers. And it's where Elijah tried to show them God's power as compared to the Baal false god. And he says that when the Jewish temple in Jerusalem was taken down, the Samaritans offered to come and help rebuild the temple. But by 536 BC, they wouldn't even talk to them anymore. And this offer was not accepted. They wouldn't even do mixed marriages or any have any sort of relationships at all. So the Samaritans at that point still had their temple, but in 130 BC, John Hyrcanus was part of the Maccabees and destroyed the Samaritan temple. That was the end of their temple now, too, because they felt they had compromised too much to paganism under the Greeks. They had a temple of Zeus at the same location, and that was it. There was no more talking. It was all an out war with them. And so we see at the time of Jesus, Jesus starts to have dialogues with the Samaritans even though the rest of the people are like, why are you talking to that person? Do you know they're a Samaritan? We even hear the story of the Good Samaritan, where all the right people walk by an injured, attacked man, but it was the Samaritan who stopped and took care of him. And then later in time, the Byzantine Empire, the land shrank even more. They eventually got sacked by the Muslim conquest in 600 AD, assimilated or put to death. And then in the 12th century AD, there were about 1,900 Samaritans left. And today, there's about 850. So it's a group that's either joining the Jewish groups 
or assimilating in with the Muslim groups. So it's really interesting. I think it's interesting when I watch the TV show, The Chosen, every time Jesus talks about going into Samaria and talking to the people there, everyone's like, really? We have to go to Samaria? People found it to be dangerous. They found it to be a place where they would get discriminated or attacked. And they didn't like each other. Again, these are people who had no trust for each other. But we know in the New Testament, it was part of God's plan to bring the Samaritans back in with believers of every kind. Jesus talked to everybody and the Samaritans were included too. So my challenge to you is think about how these people groups disliked each other and how these relationships broke down. We see people who won't talk to each other and maybe we're even related to each other. We have countries that were east and west or north and south or this side or that side or this faith and that faith. Think about that. When thinking about these people groups in Israel, of how they started out as sons and grandsons of the same family and how that eventually splits up. Sometimes it's their fault because we're sinful people and we like to fight with each other. And sometimes it's not their fault because they get split up physically through war, through political measures. And you can see even today that kind of thing still happens. Everyone, thanks so much. Please remember that you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Love to hear what topics you would like to hear about. I'm finding it interesting to take some of the topics out of Matthew and do entire deep dives into that topic inside of this podcast. So the two are somewhat related and you can find the Bible in Small Steps in most podcasting applications. If you were listening to the Bible in Small Steps and it stopped working after episode 12, That is because I moved the website over to its own website and changed the feed address. That worked in almost every podcasting app out there. There are a few that it broke the chain and all you have to do is delete the podcast, re-add it, and then they'll start populating again. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. And remember, our path towards reconciliation to other people starts with long, small steps.